Now let us review. There are three applications to properly interpret the Word of God, and this becomes more eye-opening in dispensationalism. A lot of people have struggled to find the right interpretation in the Scripture, especially when you talk about double application. Uh, if any of you who are watching us online or people here who might forget that, you'll have to go back to our previous lessons. Now, those who are watching online, we do have a playlist. It's called Spiritual Dispensationalism, so it should be easy for you to find if you go to our playlist section and then just click on that and then you can start from Lesson 1 to Lesson 2 and Lesson 3. So I strongly urge you to do that. That way this part of the teaching will connect. Now, if you haven't watched those things and these things make sense and start connecting, you're still going to miss out a lot because the previous three lessons were a lot that would be helpful. Amen. So it would be better to go by sequence first before watching this. If, you, if you've undergone those three teachings, and you have pretty much, this is going to connect everything and make everything sense. Historical, doctrinal, spiritual. And I strongly believe, like I told you before, that for us, when we look at those verses, there can be a double, triple application form. And the reason why is because God is a spirit. Because God is a spirit, as He deals with mankind here, He's going to deal with them spiritually. Because He's a spirit. So, when we look at these different timelines here, God, He's seeing everything at once. And the reason why is because He is I am that I am. Being I am that I am, that supports the theology of His omnipresence of who He is. Being omnipresent and the tetragrammaton, I am that I am, He cannot be bound by time. Now, when you look at here, this is all bound by time. So, in our perspective, we see divisions of time. But in God, there is no division. He can see... So, you and I can see this whole timeline, all these multiple timelines at once. See that? But when we're in there, it's not. So in God's perspective, this can go simultaneously with this. This can go simultaneously with this. This can go simultaneously with this because he is present tense. I am that I am. So when he's speaking, he's speaking could be present tense, past tense, future tense. But that doesn't mean it's going to be our past tense, our future tense. We can illustrate with some examples and... I probably uh, gave it at our first part of the discipleship. But in the Old Testament, he talked about Jesus Christ being crucified at Isaiah 53. And the verse said, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we are healed. So that is in past tense. And Jesus Christ's crucifixion already healed their iniquities. It already forgave them of their sins in the Old Testament. So the writer should have wrote future tense. He will be wounded. He will be bruised for our transgressions. But he put past tense. This proves that when the authors are writing, that a lot of times it's not going to go in their timing. Okay? Okay. It's going to always be God's timing. If an author here is in the Old Testament and he is writing a verse 
he's going to be writing for God. So because he's writing for God as he's writing down the verses, now look at this. When he's writing down the verses, and this is the theology regarding inspiration that they're going to agree with. So there are several methods of inspiration, but this inspiration method that theo theologians agree that all Christians agree with, pretty much every Christian agrees with, is, <coughs> excuse me, is plenary verbal inspiration. Plenary verbal inspiration. Now, Millard Erickson, you can look at his Christian theology book, and he will explain. And you can look at Pensacola Christian College's uh, doctrine books. It's called Bible Doctrines. They teach it at 10th grade level, believe it or not. And I believe Alvin Douglas's book will also kind of explain the process of inspiration. But Millard Erickson, he goes deeply in, into explaining what theologians agree regarding ver plenary verbal inspiration or the inspiration process. In other words, God uses a human with his style, his personality, but he lets the Holy Spirit guide him where every single word is from God but it will not separate the human part. Why is that important? The human part is physical. The human part is historical. Why? History is his story or story of man. Human, story of human, human author. When he's writing, obviously there's a historical application then. But because he's writing for God and God the Holy Spirit, every single word, they call it plenary verbal. In other words, every single word is from God. Then the spiritual is added there too. Then you get the spiritual application. See, there is no stinking way you separate spiritual application. Spiritual application is ingrained within every word of God. And as you interpret it, you better have a spiritual application in mind. Now, this connected now the dots with all of our previous lessons, haven't it? Remember, there's a historical interpretation, there's a spiritual application, and there's a doctrinal application. Now, here's the interesting thing, all right? Now, this is just Gene Kim's theory, so it's, if it's heresy, it's heresy, okay? Now, what I believe, though, is that doctrine can come out because of the historical because sometimes when you're learning something historical, for example, the Old Testament Jews, when they kept the Sabbath during the Old Testament timeline, you were stoned to death. That was a doctrine that is doctrinal for Old Testament. Old Testament doctrine. That's not Christian doctrine, right? When we talk about the doctrine, once saved, always saved. If you receive Jesus Christ by faith, you cannot lose it. That's a salvation that cannot be lost. That is a doctrine that historically applied, that was historically spoken by Paul to Gentiles at their timeline. See that? So there's a historical application that shows the doctrine that was believed at that time. The spiritual application, believe it or not, can produce as much doctrine. Now, why is that? Uh, Dr. David Walker, he gave a very good point when he was trying to debug, uh, debunk mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists. So he probably doesn't know it, and I'm just interpreting for him. And then at summer camp, he can call me a heretic, all right? But I am interpreting for him how I perceive when I read his books. Whether he knows it or not, 
when he was debunking mid-Acts hyperdispensationalist, he pointed out, uh, now we're at Hebrews 1, but turn your hand to uh, 1 Timothy 3, okay? Or 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. He mentioned that the scriptures, even though it is supposed to have doctrine as priority, there is a doctrine that shows godliness, that shows spiritual aspects. That's where we can debunk the mid-acts hyper-dispensationalist. So mid-acts hyper-dispensationalist they're only looking at a historical application, the dividing. So they will assume that general epistles, which are the Hebrews of, uh, which are the Hebrews, which are the epistles from Hebrews to Revelation, that those are referring to tribulation Jews. That's what they're dividing it at. And that is true. We can see tribulation doctrine here. However, they ignore in those verses where you can apply doctrinally to Christians. Hyper-dispensationalists will insist that, no, because those verses were spoken to those Jews at the, at the tribulation time period. See, historical? Christians cannot claim doctrinal application from those verses. But what if we were to argue spiritual application? If Christians looked at those verses in the general epistles, and you and I have done that, right? When you and I look at those verses, there is no doubt verses in there that you and I can claim for doctrine, right? Even though historically, let's assume that's for tribulation Jews, there's no doubt there are verses there that can apply to us, that we can practice, that we can perform for ourselves. There is absolutely no doubt about it. We saw that plainly in the book of Hebrews, for example, about having faith, looking unto Jesus, going through chastisement. Come on, you're going to say that's only tribulation Jew. There's no doubt you can see a lot of Christian application here. But mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists, they'll insist, no, that's for tribulation Jew because it's historically written as such. But here's the thing. When we look at those verses, clearly we can apply that to us doctrinally. But if we can't do that historically, let's say, how about spiritually? Because aren't there spiritual lessons in there, even though it's historically applied to somebody else? But there's spiritual lessons in there that we can learn from that is applicable, that practically works for us. Absolutely. If you don't think so, then are you saying that Christian chastisement is not a doctrine for Christians? Come on now. I don't think mid-Acts will go that far, but it makes me wonder now if they do believe in chastisement. I do know it, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, it does talk about Christian chastisement there. So God certainly chastises Christians. So when we look at Hebrews 12, I mean, that pretty much works for us, practically speaking spiritually speaking, as a doctrine, chastisement doctrine for Christians. That's an example, see, of looking at through a spiritual application, but getting a doctrine out of it. So in other words, spiritual will result in doctrine, historical will result in doctrine. Doctrine, get this, is not a standalone application. Okay, let me repeat that again. The, I think that's where Bible believers make the mistake. When, we, when Dr. Rutman lays out these three applications, they are absolutely correct. It's the most genius way to interpret a complicated book like the book of Revelation. Historical, doctrinal, spiritual. But the problem with Bible believers is that they have uh, drastically separated the three rather than seeing how these three can sometimes merge or converge or go in, within their own boundaries. 
See that? If you think do, uh, what Bible believers pride in is doctrinal application. Mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists, they'll pride in doctrinal application, but they forget the historical and the spiritual side. They think it's only doctrinal. That's why they think that Hebrews through Revelation, it's doctrinally for tribulation Jews. It's not doctrinally applied to Christians. Well, hey now, you got to look at the historical factor behind it. That's why Mid-Acts hypers will, uh, will exclaim, because from what they're looking at historically, it's written to Hebrews, right? Book of Hebrews. James, written to the 12 tribes of Israel. See that? So they're looking at it historically, what the author is writing historically to his people. And then because of that, they think that it's all tribulation doctrine. But when God is guiding that person to write, as that person is writing, let's assume historically for the Jewish people in the tribulation, God sees from a spiritual perspective, you know, that verse works well for Christians as too. And I can see that verse could also work well for the church at that time period. See that? Whole nother level there. Whole nother level. So let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16. This is the most famous verse that you use against hyper-dispensationalists who insist that not all scripture can be applicable to you. So we argue, yes, it can, because verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So notice right here that everything in the Bible is applicable to you. Now, quite often I will say not every verse in the Bible applies to you. The Bible applies to everyone throughout all time periods, right? So when I say that, obviously I am looking the historical factor. So like Old Testament law, you stone a person to death if he took God's name in vain. No, I don't think that verse applies to me. But what I mean by every verse being applicable to you is when you take these factors, doctrinal, Reprove, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Notice right here, doctrinal parts, historical parts, and spiritual parts here. See that? With these wordings here, you can apply it as a spiritual, uh, spiritual action. Reproof, instruction, and righteousness. Or you could take it as a historical factor for reproof, for doctrine, etc., so this is the verse to debunk mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists. Every scripture, we say, we use it for ourselves. We apply something to us. It may not be historically in the doctrinal aspect, but can't we take a spiritual lesson out of it? And yes, there's a doctrine in there. There's a doctrine found in there. Why? Because verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, Truly furnished unto all good works. So hyper-dispensationalists, they're not genuine, real dispensationalists then. They're not real, genuine Bible believers. A real, genuine Bible believer, the verse says in verse 17, to be real, to be perfect, to be genuine as a Bible believer is to, verse 16, have all those applications, spiritual, doctrinal, and historical. That's crucial. Inspiration, right? Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is the process of inspiration. How can one separate the historical from the spiritual? You can't. Even academics, I taught you from last week, they realize these two have some merging there more than you think. One, it cannot be just one or the other. Y'all remember that or y'all forgot that? Okay, y'all remember, right? Okay, if you forgot, then, <laughs> then it's just a waste of time what I'm going to go through. So remember, the academia realm, they pride in historical interpretation, which is why they try to find contradictions in the Bible. But then the Christians, because they always used, they're always used to spiritualizing verses, they abused it to a point where they only focus on spiritual application and make up weird interpretations, correct? But remember, the dispensationalism method is born 
from systematic theology. And systematic theology was born because of the branch where theology was trying to harmonize verses, recognizing the historical factor as well as the harmonizing with all those verses in a spiritual lens. So you might recall that. So that, that is why we emphasize quite often about systematic theology, which is one of the branches, two branches of theology, but dispensationalism is the most prized. Why? Because it concentrates on historical. It just doesn't think about spiritually harmonizing everything. See that? Dispensationalism emphasizes the historical literal interpretation of the word, but it's a branch from systematic theology. That's a spiritual har harmonistic approach, part of theological hermeneutics, which is a spiritual, more of a spiritual method. You remember that? If you all forgot that, then you, you got lost on what I said. But remember, that was where the terms that we learned in our last lesson, okay? So, there's no doubt, so far, people are going to have to agree, theologically speaking here. See that? So I'm connecting everything now theologically here. It's a, do it's a theological doctrine of inspiration. It's the theological doctrine of omnipresence. And it's a theological perspective that uh, matches really well and really explains this theological perspective on what? dispensationalism means, which is a theological approach. It really shows you the real, accurate, systematic theolo theological approach, which is dispensationalism. See that? The theologians know, and they're conjuring up with their own methods that can bridge the historical and spiritual interpretations, the applications. Dispensationalism is the best method. Remember, I argued that. Why is that? Because it is a branch from theological hermeneutics that harmonizes the verses, sp uh, which is the spiritual application, but it prioritizes historical grammatical approach out of all systematic the theological approaches. It's dispensationalism. And remember, Millard J. Erickson, I told you before, he mentioned that when you interpret the Bible, you interpret it literally as a word says, from that historical time period. But when there's something that you cannot do it by a literal historical approach, then you resort to theological hermeneutics after that, the other theological systems. That's dispensationalism. We prize and we approach historically, literally, as the verse says. But when there's something that's not matching here, then we look at a spiritual interpretation. We apply it spiritually. And that harmonizes the verses. And that resolves the contradictions. Comprende? Okay. All right. So we all understand. Now, if some of you are lost, then just uh, go gloss through the previous videos again. All right? Then they'll start connecting. If you, ha if you wrote notes on it, that might help you, all right? If some of the terms that I gave out, okay? So you just have to look at your previous notes and then stuff, some of the stuff I'll say will connect. Okay, now that's given out, um, and I've already spent almost half an hour, okay? So here we go. Now we understand this spiritual historical will collide. Now, remember, when I taught dispensationalism, the number one key that I used, and I don't know if other Bible-believing dispensationalists will be resorting to this, but I hope they do, because it will explain everything. It is physical versus spiritual dealings. That is the number one crucial factor that will explain everything in dispensationalism. But now let me expound that with this lesson. What does that mean? Okay, let's go from a theological perspective here. Why do we have to have spiritual, physical dealings? God is a spirit. When he created the universe, it is spiritual or physical? Physical. How can God interact and react to the physical universe? 
unless there's spiritual and physical dealings. See that? That's why it makes sense. You know what dispensational is? A dispensationalism is? <laughs> it's God's dealing with man. So when God the Spirit is dealing with man, physical universe, there's a spiritual and physical dealing that's colliding, that's interacting with each other. It is absolutely impossible to separate that. If people think I'm making that up in dispensationalism, you just got to go back to epistemology or just basically common sense and think about how can God, who is a spirit, deal with physical mankind and physical universe without spiritual and physical dealings? Come on, man. That's just common sense. That's just basic, foundational. Duh, 101, okay? Everyone, uh, so I don't think that anyone would disagree with me on that. So this is not something that I'll make up too. This is just common sense. If we agree with that, then why can't we use dispensationalism? Because dispensationalism is God dealing with man throughout history. As we undergo through that, then his plan and purpose and his divisions that he laid out dealing with mankind will make sense. They think that God, that because he is unchanging, that uh, when he makes a rule or gives a command, that, Christian, that Christians of all time period or saints of all time periods are just going to have to go by a system. Uh-uh, that's not how it works. Why? Because, think about it, God knows the different cultures, the levels, and the personalities and the settings of people and environments throughout all time periods, that they're all different. So when God, the Holy Spirit, deals with everybody, he deals with all of them differently. Why? Because he won't give them a burden greater than they can bear. He will prep it in a way that fits them. And what fits for them will not fit for you. And that is basic 101 theology and if you disagree with me on that one, then why does every pastor teach that God gives every man their own burdens, their own callings? One that fits you that won't fit me. Come on, man. See? So let's look at Hebrews 1 now. Hebrews 1. Look at this. This is the historical colliding with the spiritual. This is the physical colliding with the spiritual. Hebrews chapter 1. And this is the verse that some people use for dispensationalism. Notice in verse 1, Hebrews 1, 1. God, spirit, right? Who at sundry times. Ah, physical time periods. And let's be honest, not all time periods are the same. Come on, don't tell me that today's church age is Old Testament law. They're a very different culture, even if you don't believe in dispensationalism. They're very different cultures, very different people, very different time periods. So God, the whole God who is a spirit, has to deal with different physical time periods. So why do you get rid of the differences then? <laughs> Common sense. All right, let's keep reading. Sundry times and what? Divers manners. See, different ways spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Here's another one. Go to, uh, oh, uh, I forgot 1 Timothy 6.3. I apologize. To prove doctrine, doctrine can also be spiritual. So I forgot to prove that. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. 1 Timothy 6, verse 3. So if hyper-dispensationalists ignore the spiritual lessons that can be learned, which is doctrinal, then you show them 1 Timothy 6.3. The Bible says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words. So that's talking about mid-acts. That's talking about th those hypers. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to the doctrine which is what? According to godliness. See that? So notice that it is within the spiritual application here. But uh, if some people deny that, there's a lot more. You can use Titus 2, verse 7 through 10. 
And that verse shows doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. It also says adorning the doctrine of God in all things. So that's a spiritual application. So there's no doubt that doctrine is within the lines of spiritual living. Another one is 2 Timothy 3.10, 2 Timothy 3.10, which says, you fully know my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Okay, so doctrine is a part of spiritual living. There's no doubt about that. If doctrine is a part of spiritual living, why can't I see spiritual things in other historical passages that are not for my time period and then live my spiritual life from those things that can apply to me spiritually. What's wrong with that? And, can that, and can't that be called doctrine? Because you gotta think about this. How do you spiritually live without doctrine? Then, then your morals or your rules are all relative. You're just making things up. So you have to have a doctrinal basis for those things. A lot of Christians don't understand when they say that I look at this verse spiritually, you don't realize this, but there's a doctrinal basis behind that. That's good, preacher. Yeah, that's good. Okay, a lot of people don't think about that. All right, like I told you, this is the number one lesson that's going to connect the most dots, and that'll be extremely helpful. So I hope that your ears are still open and then you're still having more light bulb mo moments. If you don't, then, yeah. then I guess, uh, yeah. sorry, you know, this yeah. lesson's yeah. not for you, then... Yeah then dispensationalism won't mean that much, okay? But anyway, now get this. This is going to make a lot of sense with the, a lot of our theological arguments and our beliefs. Okay, physical universe. These are the laws of the universe, laws of science, okay? Now, Adam, when he sinned, but before he sinned, we see the spiritual and physical realms working in harmony together, right? Adam was able to walk and talk with God. So how can a physical human do that with a spiritual being unless these two are in harmony that time? But what happened? It's called the fall, okay? The fall is what changed everything. The fall of man is pervasive from all the way here to there. This is what broke the spiritual harmony. When it fell, Adam spiritually died, correct? So how can he deal with him spiritually then? So he cannot do that. He has to deal with him physically. Hence, that's why they had to do works of the flesh for salvation by their conscience, which is in their physical body. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So that's why Old Testament salvation, there was works involved there. For people to deny works, then they haven't been reading their Bible. So here's an example. Uh, the Bible says that the works they're doing, it's from the flesh. So go to Galatians 3. Yeah, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, and then notice right here that the works are related to the flesh. It's not related to the spirit, okay? Look at verse 2, verse 2, Galatians 3, 2. The Bible says, This only would I learn of you, received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of what? Faith. Now, what do you think is more spiritual, physical law or faith? Faith is more spiritual, isn't it? So the spirit operates based on faith, not on the works of the law. Why? Because it's related to flesh. Look at verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the what? Flesh. See that? So it's physical. Works is physical. The Old Testament, that's why they had to have works. Now, did they have faith? Of course they had faith. I mean, you can't separate faith. But here's the crucial factor. You ready for this? Whenever God, the Holy Spirit, dealt spiritually with them, 
Wasn't the primary factor physical for his spiritual dealing to work? Come on. For example, when Samuel poured a physical anointing oil on Saul, the Holy Spirit was then able to come upon Saul. Now that's different from us Christians. When we did a spiritual act, faith, then the Holy Spirit came down on us. See that? Okay. Uh, another example. There's no, there's no doubt that God did miracles, right? And these defied the physical laws of the universe. But he did the miracle, and these miracles were visible, physical for humans to see. That's why Christians are not undergoing healing signs, wonders, visions. Why? These are all physical, fleshly experiences. So God doesn't do that. He says we walk by faith, not by sight, physical. That's why he said that as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we walk by faith, not by sight for Christians. But Jews went by sight. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says the Jews require a what? Sign. Sign. See, they go, Jews are the ones that undergo the healing signs, vision, miracles, speaking of tongues and stuff like that. These physical manifestations are because of God's physical dealings. If he were going to operate something spiritually that defied the physical laws of the universe, where their physical experiences can see his spiritual acts in play, he had to go, like I've pretty much explained it, so, but he had to go by physical dealings. That's how he did his spiritual dealings. He primarily based it off of physical dealings. Do we understand so far? So, now we understand why they go by the law, why they have to do works. We know that no one is perfect enough to go to heaven. No one says that they are. But in the flesh, they're considered perfected. See that? But spiritually in God's eyes, they don't qualify for a spiritual heaven. It's 100% pure. No one's that perfect. No flesh can ever compete with the spirit. Okay? No flesh can compete with the Spirit. So with their fleshly limitations, that's why God put them underneath the earth. Because it's a physical realm there. See that? So he puts them in a place called Abraham's bosom. Now for some of you who didn't know, that is Dispensationalism 101. If you don't know Dispensationalism 101, I urge you to uh, read my booklet, Amazing Dispensationalism from Genesis to Revelation, Amen. but also my Dispensationalism playlist. Amen. That playlist will have everything about that. So, but anyway, so the, the Old Testament saints, they didn't die and go to heaven. They went underneath the earth. That's why theologians recognize that. They call that Sheol. That's why they recognize that. In English, it's, the English rendition is hell. Why? Because in hell, there were different compartments. One's a place of torment, another a place of comfort, which is Abraham's bosom, some people call it. Paradise did go to hell, and the evidence is if you actually look at, um, what is it, Ezekiel? Yeah, if you look at Ezekiel, it talks about Eden, which is paradise itself that went down to the heart of the earth. Anyway, that's a whole different teaching. That's dispensationalism 101, so I'm not going to do that here. What I'm doing now is an advanced dispensationalism, okay? I'm trying to connect the spiritual and physical, so I'm going to just keep concentrating that part, okay? So, that makes sense how God dealt with them. Now, here's another thing a lot of people don't understand. This will solve the debate with Calvinism. Now, you know what the enemy camp of dispensationalism is? It's covenant theology, which is a branch from Calvinism. They're all about God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty, right? Now, here's the thing. Dispensationalism bridges his sovereignty and free will. You might say, why? Think about it. History is man's story. By their deeds, their actions, they create history. That's why I keep trying to tell you what men learn from history is that Men never learn from history, meaning those deeds 
that those men did in the past, we should have learned from and not repeat their pattern. Yeah, that's good, preacher. What they've done in the past, we could improve upon. What they've done in the past, we could de accumulate the knowledge and create something better. That's why uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who's so messed up in the head, but he majors in history, the devil gave him some wisdom there, and he was able to predict future things. Why? Because he majors in history. See, that history is a very powerful factor to create or to own the whole world. That's why Hitler, he was able to make good conquests. Napoleon Bonaparte as well. They studied past records of war, different kingdoms and conquerors and conquests. So history is very crucial. It's the deeds of man, the works of man, the free will of man. So the free will of man, which is undergoing right here, God is working and plan is operating the same time. And God is sovereign. And God being sovereign, he lets mankind, you know what proves his sovereignty more? That his plan still does not fail no matter what free choice man decides. How the historical events play out. His plan will still stand. Why? He sees past to future. So as the free will of man is undergoing throughout these dispensations, God's sovereignty is operating here. That's dispensationalism. If you look at Clarence Larkin's book, the title is Dispensationalism, God's Plan for the Ages. What's that? God's plan? Sovereignty. Uh, the spiritual application for the ages physical dealings, man, did that make any sense? This is incredibly eye-opening. It, it bridges, it answers every theological problems and issues. That's why I'm arguing right here, and I'm insisting, and this teaching will prove beyond reasonable sh shadow of a doubt for Christian theology, if you don't believe in dispensationalism, you got wrong doctrine. There is no doubt about it. This is part of the, this is, really scientific too, you have to understand. Why is this scientific? Because you can't ignore historical criticism. You can't ignore historical truth, what happened at those times. And the, what, they, what these authors wrote historically, let's be honest, I mean, th th what they wrote doesn't historically apply to you, okay? No matter how, how much you play theological hermeneutics to make it harmonize with you. There's no doubt about that. You have to leave history as it is. It is a scientific truth. If this is a scientific truth, science is what? Physical observation of the universe. In other words, I insist this, and I argue, and yeah, it's just me, okay? But I think it's just common sense if you were to connect the dots, is that dispensationalism is a scientific method and a scientific truth. You disregard dispensational doctrine, you get rid of hard science. That's what I insist. That's what I insist. Why? Because when God deals with mankind, he's going to deal with them in their physical universe. He's going to deal with them. So he cannot go against the laws of nature. Laws of nature are science. It's hard science. With the laws of nature at play, God cannot contradict that when he deals with them. When sin corrupted and affected all of nature, yeah, guess what? That's why there's corruption, disease, everything going on, immorality going around. No matter how, bio how much you insist as atheists on how you biologically evolved, uh, evolved you can't expla explain morals and ethics, no matter how hard you try. You know why? Because that's a part of your biology, but you can't explain how those morals derived or evolved there. So there is no doubt sin is a part of that. Immorality is a part of our physical working of your biology, but you can't explain that unless you have Bible, unless you believe there is a God. See, so that's why I ins you have to insert the spiritual there as God is physically dealing with the universe. Okay. Now that I said all of that, 
here's the interesting thing. God is God. He created the laws of nature, the laws of science, right? Can't the law giver change the laws? Okay. In the Old Testament, let's go to Romans 4. Romans 4. This is the best chapter to show exceptions, okay? Now, we got a problem here because here's the author, and let's say it's Paul. Paul is the author. As an author, you know what he did? He uh, took Old Testament verses for church age application. So verses about the church age, he, he used Old Testament verses. Do you know why he used Old Testament verses? Because he didn't have, the New Testament wasn't written out. So he only had Old Testament. So he had to use Old Testament to prove his Christian doctrine. Is he lying? He ain't lying. So then how do mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists explain Paul, who used Old Testament verses for Christian doctrine? They can't explain that. They can't explain that. Do you think that Paul was lying? No, he's not lying. Let's, so let's go to Romans 4. You know what the easy answer is? Spirit. Why is that the easy answer? Because God is the spirit. He's the exception to the physical universe. He is the lawgiver of the physical universe and the physical laws of nature. He can make exceptions if he wants to. So his, look at this now. So see right here the exceptions? They go within this physical plane here based on his spiritual power. Because God is a spirit, he has spiritual power. He's not bound by the laws of the universe. Only when he deals with mankind, then he'll be bound on those things and deals with them. But when he prioritizes his spiritual dealing there, he can make the exception. He can change the law. He can override the law. Why? Because he's the lawgiver of the spiritual and physical realms. So think about it. Miracles are physical manifestations, but they're not from the physical laws of the universe. They're from the spiritual power of God. So the spiritual power of God can override the physical laws. It is a law that time to go by works, right? It's a law of science. It's a physical law. They had to do works for salvation. See that? That's a law. The exception to the rule, exception to the works. He could do it based on imputation. By faith, he does imputation. Imputation, think about it. What does imputation mean? That means counting someone as righteous by God. That's a spiritual act, not a physical act. So Abraham, without works of the flesh, he was able to be imputed righteousness. So look at Romans chapter 4. So Paul, he had to prove salvation by faith, not by works. And he found Old Testament passages to prove it. Romans 4, 1. What shall we say, say then that Abraham our father as what? Pertaining. Pertaining to the flesh hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works. See that? Related to the flesh, right? Yeah, that's good, preacher. He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was what? Yeah. Counted unto him for righteousness. There's imputation. Mm -hmm. Notice Paul uses this verse to prove salvation by grace, not by works. Verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. David. You know who another exception is? Verse 6, yeah. David. David. So we already see the exceptions here. The exceptions with these humans are Abraham and David. Why? Because David broke the physical law regarding adultery and murder. He was supposed to be killed himself. But God made him an exception and he didn't have to die. 
That's why it was called the sure mercies of David. God forgave him of his sin and transaction without a physical penalty, a physical act from the physical law. He forgave him. What? That's spiritual. A spiritual act was in play. So when we look at verse 6, even as David also describe it, the blessedness of the man unto whom what? God imputeth righteousness without works. That's all spiritual there. Amen. Saying, blessed are they whose sins are forgiven, uh, whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Hence, we see an exception here. Think about other exceptions. Samson committed fornication, but the Lord considered him as a hero of the faith at Hebrews chapter 11. Think about Lot. He committed incest and then was in the worldly living lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah. But Lot, he was called a righteous man as Second Peter. Now, here's a bigger one, okay? A good one, think about this. Jesus even gave exceptions before he died on the cross. You might say, how did he do that? For example, yeah, come on. Uh, there was a woman whose sins were ma many, and then she was crying at Jesus' feet. And the Pharisee said, if, she, if Jesus knew what she was, that she was indeed, she's really a sinner. But Jesus said that your faith, your faith hath saved you, he said, literally, and your sins are forgiven. How did he do that without the law of Moses there at play? Because he's God. He can give, pronounce the spiritual declaration, you're forgiven. And by your faith, spiritual act, I can forgive you. See that? So how do mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists debunk that? If they insist that, no, there is no New Testament Christian doctrine found in Matthew through John and through the Old Testament. Buddy, then Paul was lying. And number two, you have not really studied your Bible because there were people who were saved by faith, not by works in the Old Testament. There are plainly verses on that. Otherwise, I would love to hear your explanation. How did Lot stay saved? How was Samson, how was Samson stay saved? And how did that woman get her sins forgiven? Unless Jesus was lying to her before Jesus died on the cross. He didn't even shed his blood to wash away and forgive the sin. And some people are big about the blood, the blood, the blood. On, that only the blood. You know, God can do things. God can do things on his basis on how to save a soul, how to forgive a person. Do I, uh, am I dismissing the blood? No, the blood is significant and important, but I don't like it when you're like a mid-acts hyper-dispensational mindset that you have an only perspective, yeah. all right? We, do, we don't deny there was salvation by works with the Old Testament faith, but it wasn't only that way. There were exceptions in that time. Otherwise, Paul was lying. Now, let me give you a really good one. Go to Romans 1. And Habakkuk 2. Oh, yeah, that's good. Come on. Here's a really good one. This s solves the answer with Paul lying. Go to Habakkuk chapter 2 and Romans 1. Habakkuk chapter 2 and Romans 1. Now, Habakkuk 2 shows you what the just shall live by faith is. Yeah. If you look at Habakkuk chapter 2, Notice verse 4, that it, regard, it is related to works yes, when you have Old Testament faith. Habakkuk 2.4. Uh, 2, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Oh, so he's not living uprightly. See that? That's good works. But the just shall live by what? His faith. His, faith. Yeah. his own faith. That's, uh, you notice his there. That shows human, physical. See that? So the faith must have something physical there, which is the works. Verse 5, Yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell. So notice right here, because of these bad works, these sins, that he's not considered the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith are those who don't do these sins and who is upright. But look at what Paul said at Romans chapter 1. He contradicted Rome, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. 
Romans 1, 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Not faith to works, but that's what Christian churches are telling you. That if you have genuine faith, it will lead to works. No, no, no. Faith to faith. That's what Paul said. Complete salvation. As it is written, the just shall live by what? He dropped his. Why? We say amen, right? We say amen to that one. And we'll run the bases on that one. But if you're, if you're going to be an honest critic, you liar, Paul. You minus his and change the whole meaning. You know what the answer to that is? Who is the author? Who is the author? God. God is a spirit, can make the exception. He tells Paul what to write. So that spiritual thing is at play where Paul is not lying when he's writing. Why? Because God, the Holy Spirit, is the author. He can uh, do whatever he wants with his words. Can't you do, uh, if you write something, can't you do what you want as well? You have the right. God has the copyright. He can do whatever he wants with his words. You don't. You don't. So notice right here what God did. See this? What God did was he divided. I think it's more, uh, what he did was the more accurate definition or explanation is that he divided it. So here is, oh boy, I'm all over the place. Okay, let me write over here and then explain. Physical, just, and physical is purple. I think you noticed that. Live by his faith. See that? All right. Here's the author. He's writing it that way. Paul is going to write, and God the Holy Spirit is doing a spiritual division, seeing it in a different spiritual plane when he looks at that verse. Okay, I can see Old Testament here, but I can also see New Testament, how this can work. And he says, okay, I divide this to the Old Testament right here, and I can see this turning into this. And that's spiritual. But notice, this does not ignore the historical. The purple's still there. This thing is there. What if Bible believers start now interpreting verses through God's lenses, through God's method? Did that just open up a lot of things? See, double application here. Blue and purple, that's the double application. Let me give one more thing, okay, and then, then the rest of the part, maybe I'll combine it with my other teaching, all right? Don't miss the next teaching. The next teaching will be more fun, actually. That will be the fun one. This one's the most eye-opening one, but the other one is the most fun one, okay? But anyway, let me explain general epistles. That's a big problem. General epistles, uh, you've heard me insist and argue that general epistles, that there's double application. They are Hebrews through Revelation, okay? So general epistles, including the book of Revelation. Now, let's discuss historically here, okay? It's a historical fact you cannot deny. God is switching from Jews to Gentiles. The apostles, they ministered to Jews. If you want a verse on that one, uh, it, you just have to go to Galatians 2. And in Galatians 2, it shows the apostles minister to the Jews. Paul is to the Gentiles. So think about it. If you're a minister of a certain group of people, your writing is going to be based on that group. That's just historically speaking. You can't deny that. That's why you can't deny that the apostles, they had a lot of tribulation doctrine for Jews there. 
because they were ministering to Jews. Even, uh, it's amazing, when I was at Berkeley, there was a Jew teaching Bible class. Would you believe that? And he actually admitted that there's a lot of apocalyptic themes within the apostles' writing. But then Paul dramatically changed everything. Why? Because historically, Paul is for Gentiles, and he's talking about the spiritual church age, the doctrine for Christians. So, see, this is all academic stuff that's bridging with theology and scripture and just common sense, common sense, common sense. I keep saying that so many times. So, historically speaking, we get that. That's why Paul sounds more Christian. Apostles are more tribulation Jew. But it cannot be denied as well that because apostles dealt with tribulation Jew and Paul was dealing with Christians, there were apostles historically at their time period who continued their writings after Paul. Their writings, their letters were dated later than Paul. With Paul's doctrine going to the Christian church, historically speaking, the apostles are going to take some of Paul's lessons and try to apply it in their writings. So there's no doubt about that. 2 Peter 3 is one clear example. Peter said that Paul's writings are hard to be understood. Yeah. Why did he say that? Because that's not his Jewish forte. Yeah. So he's trying to take Christian elements from there. When he does that, now there's a mingling of Jewish and Christian doctrine in Apostles' writing. That's why Hebrews through Revelation is a mingling of Christian and tribulation Jew. Hebrews to Revelation. Because of that, there's no doubt about it. Now, that's historically speaking. But in our common sense minds, that doesn't make sense. So when a person is receiving the letter, how can he distinguish this is Christian and this one is tribulation Jew, right? Well, let's keep explaining historically speaking. Now, let's go spiritually speaking, okay? So I explained the historical side. That makes sense, no doubt, right? Historically speaking, the author is doing that. It just right now doesn't make sense to us on how can the audience distinguish the two, okay? But forget that. Just know that it's crucial, and there's no doubt these two elements historically make sense. It's a Pauline Christian spiritual thing with a Jewish apostolic thing. Bart Ehrman is great evidence of that. He thinks that the apostles and Jesus, they came up with their own brand of Judaism that time, but then Paul changed it to some kind of more spiritual Christian or dramatic thing for Orthodox Christian churches today. See, th th there's no doubt about that historically. So these two elements, there's no doubt about it, okay? We can agree with that historically. Spiritually, it makes sense. Why? God said to the Jews over and over again, you keep rejecting me, I'll turn to the Gentiles. But he didn't cut off the Jew immediately. He gradually faded away from Jew and turned more to Gentile. So you see right here, see this? It was a gradual thing. You notice that here? See this? It was a gradual of Jew, which is a physical people, right? Jews are physical. They're God's physical nation physical people. We know that from the Old Testament. Christians, are they a physical nation or spiritual nation? Spiritual. As God was turning more to Gentiles, the Gentiles were, expecting the sp were accepting the spiritual nation part, not the Jew. Now, if we continue onward, so this is physical spiritual mingling. You see that uh, Jewish Christian doctrine in Hebrews to Revelation. Why? Because God is transitioning Jew to Gentile. That's why he's transitioning. Why would he do that? Why couldn't he be hyper dispensationalist and just put up a clear cut time period where we end the purple here. Now we start with the blue. We end the, the Jew here. Now we go to the Christian church. The reason why he don't do that is because he doesn't do that with you. When God warns you over and over again, hey, stop that, or I'm going to use a different person for my glory, yeah. he gradually fades from you and gradually turns to the other person. So spiritually speaking, that makes the most sense as well. Okay? So theologically, this just makes all sense. Now, then how do we resolve the question about the audience? How can the audience know 
if this part's Christian and this part's historical. That will be two lessons later where I will concentrate only on general epistles, and that will be incredibly eye-opening. This one was making sense of the spiritual and uh, physical planes through theological perspectives. But did you see how spiritually speaking and historically speaking, it makes a lot of sense where you come up with your theological doctrine? Okay, see, doctrine comes out because of the historical spiritual perspectives. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.